My name is Demi, and today I'm going to talk about high-performance microservices with PHP. A little bit about myself. I'm a staff software engineer at Gloom Mobile, and I have been playing with PHP for many years, uh, since the year 2000, and worked for different companies in China and the States. And you can find me on Twitter or GitHub. Here's what I'm going to talk about today. First, I will give a brief introduction about Design Home, the mobile game that we have been working on in the last three years. Then, I will discuss different improvements, different efforts we have made to make our APIs, our microservices, extremely fast on production. After that, I'm going to discuss what else we could do to make our microservices even faster on production to push the limit of PHP. First, an overview on Design Home and some backend microservices behind it. Design Home is a mobile game that we have been developing since about three years ago, since January 2016. And it had reached some top positions, both in the US App Store for iPhones and in the US Google Play Store. And we have about over a million daily active users, over 40 million words every single day, and we have over a billion designs up to date. Our main API service serves about over 100,000 API calls every single minute, with average response time about 56 milliseconds as of now. And last month, it was still about uh, 60 milliseconds, and I will discuss how we achieved that from 60 milliseconds to 56 milliseconds later on. We are very proud of what we have achieved and like to have this chance to share our experience on how to build high-performance microservices. For Design Home, we use different microservices on the backend. As you can see from the right side, for this talk, I'm going to use the inbox microservice as an example for discussion. This inbox service, it provides REST APIs with different CRUD endpoints to manage inbox messages. And we use different tools for that. We use PHP 7, we use Nginx, we use Composer to manage different third-party libraries, including those libraries developed by ourselves. And we deploy our production instance in ECS, in Amazon ECS, and also we use different DM tools for logging, for testing, for debugging, and for secret check purpose. We use Redis and Couchbase to store those messages on the back end. And this inbox microservice is one of the busiest microservices we built. On average, we have about 30, sorry, 14,000 requests per minute. And during peak hours, we have about 34,000 requests per minute. With an average response time less than nine milliseconds. Here is a list of PHP tools, PHP extensions, that we use in most of our PHP microservices, like PHP 7. We use some cool features in PHP 7, like type declarations. We use Composer. We use AppCache. We do data cache with APCU, and we do distributed cache using Redis or something else. And if needed, we do chain cache as well. We do different tests, unit tests, black box tests, to test our API endpoints. Some team may call it feature tests or functional tests, but I feel they're similar to each other. Also, we try to do PHP the right way using different best practice from the community to make our microservices reliable, 
fast. So I feel this is something that we should consider first when building PHP applications. And in this talk, I'm not going to discuss any of these things in detail. Instead, I'm going to discuss something extra on top of this list. But before the discussion, I have two more notes to mention. First, most of our APIs are built with PHP FBM and NGX. So here, when I talk about PHP, most time, I'm talking about PHP FBM. And secondly, when I talk about those tools or extensions or something being used in our microservices, it may not just about PHP itself. It could be some tools, software that work with PHP or relate to PHP. So now we are going to discuss some different improvements that we have made to make our APIs very fast. As said previously, we start our development about three years ago. And in these three years, we have made tens or even hundreds of different efforts, improvements, to speed up our microservices. And I won't be able to discuss all of them here in this talk. So I'm going to discuss some key improvements that we have made. So I group those key improvements into four different categories here. Web server, HP processing, data storage, hardware, and network. And in each category, I will discuss three different improvements we made. First, use dockerized PHP 7 containers as web server. We used to have a single API service that does most of jobs in the background. Now, for design home, we start splitting those tasks those components into different microservices, as you can see from the right column here. So what are the benefits here? Well, considering that, OK, we have a legacy system here with hundreds of thousands or probably even millions of lines of code written by different developers at different levels. Now, you can imagine how hard it could be to write testing code for it. How difficult it could be to upgrade your PHP to new major versions, and how dangerous it could be to refactor this legacy system, and how painful it could be like, to debug issues in it. Also, how long it could take for new developers to get familiar with your system. I'm not quite sure if you have experienced this or not, but I did have experienced all these bad things. Now, think about that we use different microservices here to do different jobs. Each of those, those microservices here, small, simple, and easy to maintain. It's very easy to write testing code for each of them, and it's easy to upgrade them to new version of PHP separately. And it's easier to debug those issues in those microservices because they are small, they are simple, and for new developers, they can easy to get familiar with one of those microservices first to warm them up. So besides decoupling our microservices, we use Docker to develop, to deploy our images into Amazon ECS. And there are lots of benefits using Docker. So it helps to improve and simplify our development environments. And it's easy to upgrade your web server, your PHP environments to newer versions. And it's easy to debug issues in them. I would say Docker is a must-have tool for PHP development today. The thing is that 
okay, we have so many different microservices here, and they are being maintained by different developers. So when creating those doc images, some of them may use like Ubuntu as base image, some of them may use Debian as base image, and we could use some other stuff as base images. We have so many different images, it's hard to maintain and manage those images. And the other thing is that, assuming that you use Ubuntu or Debian to build your image, and you use APT to install PHP and some software there. So when you rebuild your image, you could accidentally bring your PHP to new versions. Even you didn't make any changes in your system, in your code, your PHP got upgraded automatically in those stock images when being rebuilt. So this is kind of dangerous, uh, and we don't want that to happen. So what we do is that, okay, we use a bunch of base images created by ourselves, which works on different PHP microservices we built. We have three main base images here. The PHP FPM one is, is being used to create different REST HTTP microservices. We use the PHP CLI base image if we need to create some job worker instances. We also have another base image, PHP SWAR. It's something we want to do something asynchronously. And when we create those base images, we have certain rules here. We don't use the tag latest anywhere. We don't think it's reliable, okay? And our tags here match with PHP versions. If we see a tag like 7.3.1, it means, okay, this base image used PHP 7.3.1. And if an image being tagged and being used on production, we are not going to change it anymore. We are not going to rebuild it anymore. It's frozen. It's never going to be changed anymore, and that's something very important. You're probably wondering, okay, what if like, we found a security issue in the image we are using on production? Well, in that case, we are going to build an image, but tag it with something slightly differently, like 7.3.1-1 or 7.3.1-2. And also, all these images, they are being built and being deployed, being tagged manually. We don't have any continuous integration jobs to do that automatically. It's dangerous. So by doing all these things, now we are taking that effort to build those microservices, to build those images. And it's easy and safe to upgrade PHP to new versions across different microservices. And it's easy to fix security issues and to make improvements across different microservices. Now, we also use different tools, PHP tools and some other tools during development and deployment. Some of those tools being integrated into our base images already. And for error handling, error reporting, we mainly use the Relic and Bug Slack and feel these two are so amazing and we like them a lot. And for security checks, we use SoundCube and the Sensio Labs Security Checker. These two tools work on different parts of your PHP source code. Like for SoundCube, it check possible coding issues in the code written by yourself in your project. While since your lab secret checker is to check those security vulnerabilities in the third party libraries being used in your project through Composer. Both of them we use everywhere. And for debugging and profiling, we mainly use Blackfire and Xdebug in our images. Now, HV processing. Well, here's the thing. Like, if we need to send out some emails in our PHP request, or if we need to send out a pushing notification, all these things don't have to be done first 
before we have HP response being sent back to the client. These things can be done in the background. And in PHP, we have different ways to do background processing. We could use an external program here to do it on the background silently. We could register a PHP shutdown function to do that, just like bug slack. We could also use a separate job queue serv server to do that in case our job, our task is heavier. And also, and the PHP FPM, we could consider to use a function called fastgga finish request to do that. There are also some other options, but uh, probably not that reliable, so I'm not going to list them here. For us, in our PHP microservices, most time we choose the last option here to use function fastgga finish request. What it does is to flush all your response data to the client first. So let's see how it works. We have two pieces of code here. They're pretty much similar to each other. But if we check the right side of one, it has a function called fastgga finish request here. So what's the difference of these two when they're being executed and the PHP FPM? Let's take a look at the left side one. It tries to print out number one first, then register a PHP shutdown function to print out number three. Then create an object of an anonymous class which has a destruct method to print out number four. Then it will try to print out number two, then call exit to terminate the execution. So number five here won't be print out at all. And now we reach the end of this PHP script. But it doesn't mean there's nothing wrong after that. First, those PHP shutdown functions will be executed in order. So number three will be printed out next after number two. After that, those destruct methods of those undestruct objects will be executed in random order. So number four will be printed out last. So for the left side, the output is one, two, three, four. Now, let's take a look on the right side. Everything's still being executed in exactly the same order, and it takes about the same amount of time for the right side. But once the function called fastgga finish request is being called here, it will flush the response to the client first, which is one only at this point. So one will be sent back to the HP client. Then it will continue to, to execute whatever after. So two, three, four, they will be printed out in your PHP FPM process, but won't be sent back to the client. The output you are going to see from HP client is just one. So here's the tricky part. By using this function call fastgga finish request, we don't save any time to execute, execute the whole PHP process, but we could send back HTTP response much, much earlier before the whole PHP process finishes. So here's how we make our APIs faster by doing background processing like that. We refactor some of our microservices to perform some operations after having HTTP response sending back to the client. Like for deleting messages, what we do is that, okay, we do some basic data validation first, then we send a successful response back to the client without any database interactions. Then we delete the message from the database in background. So by doing that, as you can see here, we decrease our response time from about 13 milliseconds to nine milliseconds for the inbox microservice. Well, some people might wondering that, okay, you are doing things in background. We don't have much visibility on those jobs, those tasks. 
what if there's something wrong, you know, happens in the background? Well, there are more things you need to do other than just putting your task in background for processing. You need to do some basic data validation first, making sure your input data won't cause issues in background processing. We do exponential, sorry, exponential backoff to make sure those tasks being performed properly in background. And also, in case there's anything wrong, anything happens, we log them, we report them properly so that we could get them addressed properly later on. So this background processing implementation has some limitations. And also, if you have something heavier, you probably shouldn't do it like that. You probably should think about to have a separate job queue to do that. Also, like if you have like logs being used here, okay, you need to make sure to unlock your resource properly before doing background processing. Otherwise, the so other requests could be blocked because of that. So we have some more detailed discussions and the implementations about this background processing approach. And you can check those links here. So lots of sites support HP compression. And many popular CMS frameworks have it implemented and enabled by default, like Drupal, WordPress, Joomla. And as PHP developers, when we create our own microservices, and we probably want to do the same thing to have HP compression be enabled. But does it really work on our microservices? Does it work as it should? Does it always work? Probably no, probably no. I'm going to show how we improved HP compression on our microservices. When doing HP compression in Nginx, the first thing you want to do is probably to have this directive, GZON, being there to have HV compression turned on. But that's not enough. You need to have another one to specify what type of responses that should be compressed. OK, if you check online and you check those NGX configurations, and you, you, you could probably always see these two, but they are not enough, especially for our case. Well, we use Amazon CloudFront as CDN service. And here's the thing. If you have your Nginx running behind the CDN or some proxy server, OK, then Nginx may not know that your CDN or proxy server supports HP compression. In that case, your HP response won't be compressed by Nginx at all if it's running behind CDN or proxy server. So to make sure HV compression always work even behind CDN or some proxy server, we need to have one more directory here called GZ proxy with proper values being there. So now it seems that we are in a very good shape, still not yet enough. There are two more things we need to think about. One is GZ compression level. The other one is GZ minimum length. The compression level is to set a compression level of your res response. And the value is between 1 to 9, where 1 is easily compressed. And for the minimum length, it is to set minimum length of a response that should be compressed. A default value is 20. And for compression level, the default value is 1. Both of them not optimized at all. Let's say if you set minimum length to 1, one byte only, and when the response being compressed, the output would be way more than one byte. So it doesn't have any to compress a response with just one byte in it. So how to configure these two properly? For us, we choose a compression level five, something in between. And the ratio probably is good. 
And for minimum length, we used to set at 120 bytes, but uh, it's not a, an optimized value. Chris Holland suggests that, OK, it's better to set it at a smallest typical value of a network packet size, like 1,500 bytes MTU, because if the response is less than, let's say, 1,500 bytes, it's going to fit in, in a packet, no matter if you compress it or not. And we totally agree with that. So now we set it at 1,280 bytes. And uh, thanks, Chris, for that. So now it seems that we have everything set on the NGX side, but still it's not enough. It doesn't mean HP compression will work as should in our PHP applications. There's one more thing we need to check on the PHP FPM side. If HP header contents is not set in, H in PHP response properly, Nginx will always compress the response, even if its length is less than the minimum length. So here's the thing. If we don't have this particular header set properly in our PHP FPM process and send it back to Nginx, then we are always going to compress the response in Nginx, no, even like the response is just about one byte long. So different frameworks having that particular head set differently. Like for Slim 3, it always has that header, the contents had been set properly by default. But for Luma and Laravel, uh, no, they don't have that particular head set at all. So if you happen to use Laravel or Lumen to build your microservices, the problem is that your HP response will always be compressed, always. And that's not what we want. To prevent that from happening, where we create a middleware to, for Laravel and Lumen to inject that header in HTTP response. That's how we get the HTTP compression parts done properly in our microservices. Content caching. So there is a very common feature request there, which is to feed new data to the client side. So if we have data push, sorry, server push being enabled, like in HTTP2, it's fairly easy. But uh, almost all our PHP microservices still use HTTP1. In that case, what we have to do is to hit the server again and again to fetch the data. And it's terrible because first, every single time when we hit the server, we are going to make some database queries to get the data. And it's expensive. And in case there are so many different users there doing the same thing at the same time to fetch data from server, it's going to be even worse. So here's how we address the issue. First, we do data cache on the server side, if possible. And also, we use the last modified and if modified since headers and return HP 304 responses back to the client if there is no any new data to be fed to the client side. So there are two benefits here. The first, we reduce network I.O. because for HP 304 responses, there is no any body content in the response. The response is very small, a tiny. And on the server side, when we return HP 304 responses back, we don't need to make that many database queries, some heavy queries, to fetch user data in that case. So reduce the database operations as well. So there are some other HTTP headers that you may consider to use to use this kind of implementation. Now, data storage. 
We use NoSQL just to make our microservices fast. And there are many, many different options you could choose from, like Redis, Couchbase, Airspark, MongoDB. And we choose to use Redis and MongoDB for our inbox microservice. Redis is very handy, especially like for sorting simple data. And it has some very interesting data structure, like set and sort list there. Couchbase is just like Memcached, but with persistent data storage and some more features there. Both of them are extremely fast, and also they can expire data automatically from your system. But there are also some limitations when we use this kind of NoSQL solutions. It's not like MySQL, not like RDBMS. There is no fancy queries available. And also, there is no something like index being there. And you need to make sure to compress, to serialize your data properly to save disk space. For our case, well, we have thousands of messages being created, being stored, and being sent out every single minute. And our database keeps increasing all the time. So we have to fight against network I.O. and to save disk space. And that's one of the biggest challenges to us. And we have tried many, many different ways to resolve that. Like, for larger messages, we try to compress them first before saving them to Couchbase. And we also try to use some features in Couchbase, like Couchbase Encoder, to serialize those data better when saving them in Couchbase. And for certain messages, like announcements, they're pretty similar to each other for different users. In that case, we don't have to save the whole message for each user. We could just create a message template, then store the message template ID or something along with some variables for different users into Couchbase. And also, for certain fields, let's say, assuming we have a field called expiration, and we, our messages are in JSON format, but we don't have to use expiration as a field name. We could probably just use E as a field name just to save space. Also, there are certain messages that don't have to be in the system forever. In that case, we use some TTL fields to get those messages expired automatically from our system, from Couchbase, from Redis. So that's our effort to fight against those I.O. and disk space. Besides, all these efforts, we also want to make sure that our database operations are fast. So for Redis operations, there are two main drivers here. One is PHP Redis. It's a C extension. The other one is PRedis. It's a library written in PHP. Um, we use the second one, PRedis, because like three years ago, PHP Redis is not yet ready for PHP 7. So we have to wait, stay with PRedis here. But the problem with PRedis is that it's, it's very nice, but it's a little bit slow, and it costs more memory. So later on, we did a refactor to use PHP Redis instead. And let's see what's the difference between these two when talking about performance. So before, when we use PRedis, the response time is about 16 milliseconds for the inbox microservice. After the refactor, we start using PHP Redis. The response time reduced from about 16 milliseconds to 11 milliseconds. And there are more ways to make Redis operations even faster. Like, you could use pipelining to speed up your Redis queries. Also, in Redis, there are persistent connections available if you want to use them. Hardware and network. 
Next question. How did we do code deployment before on production? Well, back to a few years ago, what we do was that we pack our new PHP source code first, we sync those PHP source code to different production servers. We then unpack our PHP code from those servers, replace PHP code on those production servers, then flush caches on each of those production servers. That's how we did production deployment before. There are issues with this approach. First, during the deployment, your APIs may break some requests, may break because of that, especially when we switch our PHP code. The second thing is that in case we introduce any bugs in the deployment, it takes time to find the issue, and we probably have to make another commit, a patch, to fix the issue to make another deployment. All these things take time, and during that time, your microservices are done. So now, for Design Home, we started using Amazon ECS to host our microservices. So when we're doing code deployment, what we do is that we create doc images first. That image has PHP FM and Nginx built in as web server, along with our latest PHP source code there. We then launch a bunch of new instances in Amazon ECS, and once those new instances with new code being stable enough, we start training collections from those old instances. So during this process, we always have certain amount of production instance running to serve the traffic. So there's no any downtime here. And in case we have a bug being introduced in a new image we created, and we need to do a rollback, it's fairly easy because we still have those old images being there with old source code being there. What we could do is that, okay, we bring up a bunch of instances with old images and take down those new images, those new containers with new images. So rolling back is pretty easy here as well. And let's say one of the production instance is not healthy, probably running out of memory or something, well, in that case, Amazon ECS will notice it because each instance has health check endpoint being there. When a particular instance is not healthy, Amazon will try to start a new container to replace that unhealthy one. So by doing that, we always have almost the same amount of production instance there to serve the traffic. So another very nice feature is auto scaling. Like today, usually on Thursday, we have some big sale in our game. So like today, we have more traffic coming. And in that case, we probably need more servers there to serve the traffic. And in Amazon ECS, it will notice the changes that, OK, there are more traffic coming. It will launch a bunch more instances to serve this extra traffic. So in case we don't have that many traffic now, it will reduce the amount of production instances automatically. So we have different development environments in Amazon ECS. We have like test, RC, uh, dev, staging, production, and all these things help a lot for our development purpose. And especially, we have a staging environment, which is very, very helpful to us, because when we need to deploy something big, some major changes to production, we can always test it in our staging environment first, make sure everything is OK, and it's pretty safe to do that on staging. And also, if we have some production issues, some bugs on production, and we want to identify it, we don't have to do it on production. We can test it in our staging environment, which pre works pretty similar to a production environment. Hardware upgrade, this helps a lot 
to make our APIs much faster. So in AWS, we used to use C4 instances. And last year, we upgraded our instances, doubled CPU, doubled memory. And also, we have a feature called enhanced networking enabled in our EC2 instances. And that's a very amazing feature there. With this hardware upgrade, we reduced our API responses from about 80 milliseconds to 50 milliseconds for our main service. Well, you're probably wondering that, well, OK, I did a hardware upgrade. Probably I'm going to spend more money for that. Probably, but not exactly. Because when you upgrade your hardware, OK, each of your production instance could serve more traffic. So like last month, we did another hardware upgrade. So doubled our CPU and the memory resources again. But meantime, we reduced the total number of instances on production to half, cut them down to half. So as you can see here, doing hardware upgrade may not always cost that much money as you think about. So moving everything into VPC. So we started using Amazon Virtual Private Cloud about one and a half year ago. It's not just to make our microservices safe. It helps a lot to speed up our microservices. What we have tried is to move our instances closer to each other and move them to same locations. And also, for communications between microservices and the databases, we use internal network instead of internet for that. So by doing that, it makes our API communications much, much faster than before, including those database operations. Let's take, just check another example here. So last month, we did another upgrade, not only just to upgrade those hardware, but also we relocate our microservices, those database nodes. So by doing that, for couch-based operations, so the, those operation time reduced from about 10 milliseconds to five milliseconds. So having said all these things, migrating to AWS helped us a lot to make our APIs faster. But it did take us a long time, lots of different efforts, to make things done the right way in AWS. So, well, when we started working on our microservices for Design Home back to three years ago, we were a very, very small team. We don't have much development resource. So we have to use some best practice from the industry, from the community, like HTTP1, like REST APIs, like PHP FPM. But now, OK, we have more developers. We have more resources. Now we can look into some more things to make our APIs even better, even faster. So here's something that we want to look into to make our microservices even better. So for PHFPM, so there are different great frameworks like Falcon, and also we want to look into the routing part because I feel that, okay, for most PHP frameworks, the routing part seems a little bit slow. So, but we don't have a solution for that yet. And for asynchronous operations, we are looking to solutions like React PHP or AMP, but we prefer better with SWOR, especially SWOR 4, which works very nicely if we want to build microservices on the backend side. And for network protocols, we still use HTTP 1, which is not that great for backend microservices. 
So we want to look into HP2, and also we want to look into some other protocols, like the TAS protocol. The TAS protocol is a binary protocol. It's different from JSON, because for regular JSON message, let's say it's about 54 bytes, but if we convert into this message in TAS protocol, it has only about 16 bytes, 80% less. So these are something we want to explore later on to make our PHP microservices even better, even faster. Let's end my talk today. Thanks. OK. Hello. Uh, you mentioned New Relic before. And I have a question. Have you tried any open source alternatives to New Relic, like Zabbix or something like that? New Relic, right? Have you tr have you tried Zabbix or anything like open source open source alternative to New Relic? Um, well, we have been using New Relic for a couple years, a couple years, more than five, and we feel um, that you know it's a commercial product, but it's also as a free version. We feel it's very very helpful, helps a lot for tracking um, performance, especially between different deployments. Now we see like for each deployment, um, if we, our API is getting slow or bad, and there could be many other options as well, but for now, we just stay with uh, New Relic. And I would say there's another good feature in New Relic is that when we check the performance, we want to measure the performance of different parts in your uh, APIs, like how much time being spent on Redis part, how much time being spent on, on Couchbase part, how much time being spent to make external HP cores. And New Relic could you know, get all these things being sorted out and for you. It's, I, I feel it's very handy. Uh, yeah. But there are open source alternatives. Yes. We have limited resources. We, can't, we couldn't explore all those great you know, things. Mm -hmm. Hi there, thank you. Um, this is a question about your containers. Um, do you combine PHP FVM and Nginx into a single container? And if so, how do you manage the processes uh, and when, when you bring the container up? That's a, okay, as I said before, managing those PHP images, it's a painful thing, right? Um, what we do right now is that we don't use APT to install PHP or any other PHP release software. We build them from source code so that we know, OK, when we install PHP into a particular base image, it's always of that particular version, not any like patches or minor version being upgraded. So that we build from source code. My question was more around if you combine Nginx and PHP PHP FPM processes in the same container, and how do you manage both those processes when you start the container? They have to be, uh, sorry, they, it's better to put both of them into the same image. If you put them into separate images, it doesn't help much, and also, if you put them into separate images, you need to use TCP connections between the two images for the communication between PHP FPM and NGX, but if you use soft file, for the communication between the two, it's going to be more efficient. Do you have anything that starts both the processes up, like a startup script or a process manager? You mean auto so, to manage Nginx and PHP FPM processes? Obviously, when you start the container, it starts with a single command. So, how do you bring both oh, processes oh, up? Okay, we use Supervisor D. Awesome, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a very nice. Uh, software, we use it everywhere. And we, we tried to use some other solutions, some other basic images, but we, now we prefer more on supervised D. That's great, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, hi. So the question is specific to ECS. Uh, it has two launch types. Uh, I'm assuming you're, you're using EC2 launch type. Have you played with the Fargate launch type and, and um, um, how, how does it uh, behave in terms of performance? If you have explored that. There are different strategies um, to launch uh, EC2 instances during deployment. And we mainly use two replica replica or and the demo set, they work differently. But uh, you have to dig into those details because, as I said, it costs us a lot of time to like, play with different configurations to make them work better. Um, for the like, current deployment example I mentioned here, it's about the re replica. But we don't use it. Actually, we don't use it for now. On our main service, we use another one called demo set. It's more reliable. But it takes more time for production deployment. Um, the one you mentioned, we probably use it in some microservices, but I don't have much impression on it. Yeah. Hi. Knowing what you know now, uh, where would you advise a team to start optimizing? In which uh, part of the stack? Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't get you. So knowing what you know now, where would you advise a team to start optimizing if they were to start optimizing? I, just, I still don't get it. Sorry about that. I'll, I'll try once again. So you, you've mentioned four different categories of optimizations, right? Where would this, a team should start doing optimizations if they are starting now? I still have a hard time to catch. Um, so which areas should the team start work on first? Right. Okay. Uh, probably we can talk about it later on, but okay. I, I still have a hard time you know, to catch what you're saying. Sorry about that. Uh, morning. Um, morning. Just interested in your app performance in, with a real world. So even though you're doing brilliant um, reduction in performance in terms of response times uh, internally, how are you seeing performance with people with mobile devices and the networks that they use? Uh, are these optimizations helping lots? Or are you still finding that response times to actual end users are still fairly sluggish and what have you done around that? That's another big challenge to us about to support like slow uh, mobile devices and the slow network. Um, we we still working with it, and um, it's not only just to make changes on our backend microservices side. We also need to make changes, improvements on the mobile side, on the client side. Uh, it's it's going to be a long talk and long discussion. Uh, I don't have a short answer for it, but from back and side perspective, okay, if I want to address the issue, I won't do it with, I probably won't do it with PHP FPM. I'm going to do it with some other protocols, probably other than HTTP 1. Yeah. And that's why I'm mentioning another, another base image, the SWOR, extension there, that's a very handy PHP extension to address the issue about slow network. Yeah. Hi, right. Um, do you use services on AWS like API Gateway? Excuse me? A do you use API Gateway? API Gateway, uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, if I understand your question correctly, but uh, you mean that when you set up your production uh, instances and it's being processed through some gateway? Well, two things. First, uh, our containers or our instances are running inside uh, Amazon ECS, and uh, we use uh, Amazon CloudFront as CDN to serve those traffic. But for development environments, we use some proxy server to route those traffic internally. Is that what you're asking? Or? Um, yeah, it's just more defining, like, would you use API Gateway to then go to CloudFront, then to ECS, so you can define your resources? Your That's methods. more like an ops question. 
Uh, I don't have much information about that. Yeah. Uh, in the very beginning on your slide uh, presentation, slide second or third, you mentioned that main service is talking to database and rest of services are behind the main service. So no, none of the services has access to database or they just go to main service again and again for data? Okay. Um, here's the thing. Uh, each microservice on the back end, right, they could have their own database. They don't talk to the database for the main microservice. So like for the inbox microservice, as a main, it has its own database, the Redis database and the Couch database. They don't share the same database because like for example, okay, like for our moderation service, it used MySQL, which we don't use MySQL anywhere else, especially on the main service. So MySQL is just used for a particular microservice behind. Yeah. OK, but uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, persistence between the services, how your inbox service knows which uh, message this user belongs to, or what is your that mechanism of evaluating authorization users, authorizing data among services? How do you do that? I mean, JWT or some in, in, internal local tokens or whatever, like some kind of identifiers there, or what is it? Um, here's the thing. Only the main microservice is publicly available to the client side, to the mobile game. But uh, all the other microservices, they are in VPC, and uh, we have like firewall there making sure that not acceptable accessible from outside the VPC, from anywhere. Only the main API service could communicate with all those backend microservices. That's a security concern. So, but it does mean that when we make REST APIs calls from the main service to those microservices, we don't have any validation. No, we still have validation, but something pretty simple, something like HTTP basic, basic authentication. And we, we are not yet sure you know, if there are any other better solution you know, for security purpose. But for now, that works well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, ah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, one last question. On the same topic, how the main service communicate with all the underlying service? Is uh, REST, uh, row TCP, or whatever? Well, we still use HTTP 1, the REST API calls. You know, I wish I could, we could improve it later on. But for now, all those communications are based on HTTP 1 REST APIs. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say it's the best solution, but that's what we're staying with for now.